All right, everyone, we are going to pick up where we left off. So we finished up the problem on page 68, and that was the one about the smoking. And we found that we had a, a small p-value. And remember, a small p-value gives us evidence against the null for the alternative. So we're going to reject the null and conclude that we had evidence that the percentage of adults who smoke is less than 30 Oh, that should be 25%, not 35. Okay, that should be 25%. Sorry about that. Uh, so less than 25%. All right, so uh, the next page uh, goes over a couple definitions. And the significance level we haven't defined yet. You might have defined it in class, but up here I asked if the value, the p-value is less than 0.05. So up here I was using 0.05 as a significance level. We could think of the significance level as a cutoff. So I'm going to say that the significance level um, is the cutoff uh, that is used to reject the null. Okay, so the next thing that I'm going to type is really important. Um, so if you don't write anything else down for this whole lesson, make sure you write this down. So if your p-value is less than, I'm not going to use the symbol, but I'm just going to say it less than the alpha level, then you reject the null hypothesis. If your p-value is greater than the alpha level, uh, then you fail to reject or you don't reject. Okay, so uh, the alpha level's a uh, cutoff. It's usually set at 0.05, but sometimes 0.01 or sometimes 0.1. And so if you get a p-value less than that, you reject the null. If your p-value is greater than alpha, your alpha level, then you fail to reject the null. Okay, so um, like I said, small p-values result in rejecting the null. But if you have a small p-value, then you have a large test statistic, so you want to circle large there, and then a small p-value. So large test statistic will lead to a small p-value. <clears throat> All right, and so we just did a left-tailed test in the previous uh, example. That was because this was less than, and we shade the area in the left tail. If this had been greater than, then we would have shaded the area in the right tail and it would have been a right tail test. And sometimes we do what's called a two-tailed test. That means we're interested in the area in both tails. And you always get, uh, you always decide what type of test it is um, based on the wording of the problem. So let's go back up here just one more time. Uh, the claim was that the proportion of adults who smoked in the past week is less than 0.25. So less than was my key word to use less than in the alternative. Okay, so um, just a couple definitions. The p-value is the probability of getting a value of your test statistic or something more extreme that's represented in the tail, assuming the null hypothesis is true. And we remember that small p-values gives us support for the alternative, right? So if p-value is less than the alpha level, then you reject the null and you accept the alternative. All right, and so uh, when we make a conclusion for our hypothesis test, we will either reject the null or fail to reject the null. 
reject the null if our p-value is small. So reject the null if the p-value is less than the alpha level. Or we fail to reject if our p-value is greater than the uh, alpha level. All right, and then you might have noticed that when I word my conclusions in context of the problem. So the above example, we were talking about proportion of individuals that smoke, and so I wanted to include that in my conclusion. So not only should I say whether I reject or fail to reject the null, but I also want to put that in context of the problem. All right, so just uh, two more uh, definitions, and then we'll work on some problems. So because we can always get a sample that's not representative of our population, there's always a chance that we can make either what we call a type 1 or a type 2 error. <clears throat> and these are um, errors, and so that means that we did something wrong. Of course, we, didn't, we don't know that we're going to do something wrong, but the idea is that there's always the possibility. And so a type 1 error means you falsely rejected the null hypothesis. However, the null hypothesis is actually true. Okay, so you made a mistake. You rejected the null because your p-value is small, but the null hypothesis is true. And a type 2 error is just the opposite. You falsely did not reject the null hypothesis. However, the null hypothesis is actually false. Okay, and these I know are really confusing. You just have to keep in mind that when you have a type 1 or a type 2 error, it does mean that you made a mistake. So you it's not that you knew you know you make a mistake, but there's always that chance that it could happen. And those are the possibilities that do exist. All right, so let's just finish up this um, section with a couple problems, and then we'll move on to the next section. So 8.2.2 says, when the clinical trial, the exhort method of gender selection, remember that's the problem they love in this book, where they uh, try to... Um, specify what gender your child's going to be. Uh, and a formal hypothesis test was conducted. An alternative hypothesis was the proportion of girls probably is greater than 0.5, meaning that this XSORT method would increase the likely, likelihood of having a girl. If you are responsible for developing the uh, XSORT method, would you prefer um, uh, p-value 0.99.5 and then it goes all the way down to 0.01. All right, so if you um, work for this company or develop this product, then you would want to support the alternative hypothesis. You would want to support um, that this product works, with, which means that the proportion would be greater than 0.5. And so the smaller the p-value, the more support for the alternative hypothesis. Therefore, a p-value of 0 0.01 would be preferred. Okay, remember the smaller the p-value, the more support for the alternative we would reject the null and conclude that the product worked or the proportion is greater than 50% if you had a small p-value. So 0 0.01 would probably be the best one. All right, so bottles of bare aspirin are labeled with a statement that tablets contain 325 milligrams of um, aspirin. A, a quality control manager claims that a large sample of data can be used to support the claim that the mean amount of aspirin is equal to 325 as the label indicates. Can a hypothesis test be used to support the claim? Why or why not? Well, the idea here is that we actually 
would probably not do a hypothesis test Oops, hypothesis test to support the claim because we can never prove the null hypothesis. And so a hypothesis test would look like this. It's going to be using the mean instead of the proportion because we're talking about the mean amount. And the alternative would just be probably that it's different than 325. However, we can never prove the means, uh, I'm sorry, we can never prove the null hypothesis to be true, so this isn't really a valid hypothesis test. We could show that the alternative is true, or we have evidence for the alternative, but we can never prove the null hypothesis to be true. Okay, and so um, the next couple ones, we're just stating the uh, null and alternative. There's two things to um, watch out for. We want to look for keywords like mean, greater than, proportion. Those are all keywords that um, we, we would use to see if we would use either the mean or proportion in our null and then also the sign of the alternative. And so here we have the mean annual income. So I see the word mean, I'm going to use the Greek letter mu for mean. Um, and then I also see the uh, word greater than. And so my null hypothesis, I want to make sure I have my Greek letter mu in there. That always has the equal sign and then I put 60,000. And then my alternative, I still need the Greek letter mu in there, but now I have greater than. so. It's going to be greater than, and then I have 60,000 here. Remember, those numbers always match up. These two numbers here always match up. Except I have an extra zero in there. Oops. Stop that. All right. There should be one less zero in there. Go away. There we go. All right, well, let's just do it again. So 60,000. All right, uh, so moving on, the proportion of people aged 18 to 25 who use illicit drugs is different than. So my keywords here are proportion. That means I'm going to uh, use the letter P in my null and alternative. And then also uh, different is another keyword. So here's another keyword right there, different. Okay, so my null hypothesis is that P is equal to uh, 0 0.20, and then my alternative is P is not equal to 0 0.20, because I have the word different in there. All right, and then the last one, the majority of students have credit cards. So my null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.5 because the majority means greater than 0.5. So my alternative uh, would be greater than 0.5. Okay, so that's the end of that section. And then the next video, we're going to um, start section 8.3.